Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. David Pugh. I am a staff scientist at the KAUST Visualization Core Laboratory. I am also a certified instructor with Software and Data Carpentry, which are two nonprofit organizations whose goals are to teach foundational scientific computing and data science skills to academic researchers, scientists, students, faculty, um, um, also industry practitioners, um, if there's anyone from industry. And so in today's uh, workshop, it's the second workshop in the series, the Introduction to Data Science Workshop series provided by the CALS Visualization Core Laboratory. Um, today's topic will be uh, Condom, which is a tool for installing software and managing uh, software environments, which is a fairly critical um, uh, skill that you will need to have to be successful in doing uh, data science or machine learning uh, research or in practice as well. Okay, so just some logistics as we're getting started. So I'm going to be sharing a few links via the chat. And the first link will be to today's uh, teaching materials. So I'll share that now. So there's the link to the teaching materials. Uh, I'll just share my, my screen quickly. Uh, so when you click that link, then you will, should see um, this over here, which is on the left the left hand side of my uh, of my screen. So these are some teaching materials that I have developed uh, as part of the the software carpentry's um, lesson development uh, curriculum plan, and um, they are always online. Um, always available. Um, even after the class is done, you can always refer back to these. Uh, you can print them out in PDF version if you wish. Um, th this is um, a bit of an intermediate lesson in that it's going to assume some prerequisites with, um, with the BASH course that I taught last week. Um, and that is also now up on our, our YouTube channel. Um, I'm not really going to assume any understanding of Git um, or any um, any knowledge of Python, which I will cover next week, although we will be installing a lot of Python software. Um, so you can see the schedule of, of events for today. Um, so we are going to cover most of this material. Um, so we're going to cover most of this material. I may skip around a little bit as we get towards the end. Um, in particular, we'll see if we have time to, to go into the details of managing uh, GPU dependencies uh, with Conduct. So that's a, um, an important topic if you're interested in doing GPU accelerated uh, machine learning or deep learning, uh, particularly relevant for those of, uh, those of you who are joining from KAUST and would like to access the, the computing resources that we have here um, or the GPU computing resources that we have here. Um, maybe we'll get to that, maybe we won't. We'll just have to see how um, how this afternoon goes. Okay, so the next link that I want to share is the link to the teaching materials, or sorry, not the not the lecture materials, but the um, uh, the course, the workshop repository on GitHub. So if you joined us, if you're joining from last week, it's the exact same link, same uh, same GitHub repository. Um, but if you're new, Here's the link to the GitHub repository. Now, the GitHub repository is important primarily because, so here, here's the GitHub repository here on the right-hand side of, um, of my screen, um, is important primarily because the readme file contains these two um, buttons which provide links to the cloud computing resources that we're going to be using for the workshop today. Um, the, the first, if you're joining us from within KAUST, you can click on the KAUST Blender Hub link. You can just kind of right click and click and open in a new tab. And then after 30 seconds or so, you should get a JupyterLab interface. It should look like so. And so this is an interactive computing environment um, that, is, uh, that you will be using from within the browser on your local machine. but the computing resources will actually be running on KAUST infrastructure, 
um, provided by my colleagues at the IT Research Computing uh, Group. But this is only available uh, if you're joining from within KAUST. So you either need to be on the KAUST intranet or you need to be VPNed into the KAUST intranet. If you're joining from um, outside of KAUST, whether it's somewhere else in Saudi Arabia or more further afield, then you can, you can access the exact same computing resources by clicking on the public Jupyter Lab. So if you just do a right click and open in a new tab, um, again, after about 30 seconds or so, you'll get the same, um, uh, the same uh, computing environment, but now these resources are running on infrastructure that's been provided by um, the Binder Hub Federation partners, uh, which includes Google, Microsoft, the Turing Institute in the UK, and uh, several other uh, research institutes uh, around the world. So it's the exact same software, exact same environment, just running on different cloud computing resources. I should say these cloud computing resources are also always available. So even after the workshop today, you can come back and uh, click those buttons and access the software environment and use it as much as you want. It's completely free. Okay. So any questions about that? Is there anybody who had trouble uh, clicking on one or the other of these buttons and getting access to the computing resources that we're going to use today? Now is, now is the time to, to speak up um, if, you have, if you have any questions about that. Let's see what we have in the chat. Awesome, okay. So I'm not seeing any questions about the, the compute environment. So just a couple of things, I guess, to mention uh, about the compute environment. Um, if you close your tab, then your compute environment is gone. Um, it will get cleaned up behind the scenes and the resources will be released for someone else to use. If that happens, um, just go back and click um, on one of the other buttons and you'll get a new instance. It's not a problem. All of the data and anything that we need for today's course is already included as part of the compute instance. So you can't really lose any, uh, anything critical to participate in, in today's, um, today's workshop. There's also a timeout, so an idle timeout. So if you, if you don't do anything for maybe like 10 or 15 minutes, then it's quite possible that the, um, that the compute instance will think that you've just gone away and you're done and it will automatically uh, shut itself off, and uh, in which case you'll need to close your browser tab and go back and, and click one of these buttons. So you might have a few more questions in the chat. Um, so one question, is it okay to use your local Jupyter notebook? So um, no. So for today's workshop, we're using Jupyter Lab only as an interface um, to access the terminal. So we're actually going to be using a terminal again to use the Conda tool to install software. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, um, Conda environments inside Jupyter Notebooks and, and in Jupyter Lab, uh, but it's best if you follow along either uh, in the cloud or in these cloud instances. Um, or if you already have installed um, Anaconda or Miniconda on your local machine, then you could use your local terminal and that should be fine as well. Um, but we are going to be creating a lot of Conda environments and downloading a lot of software. So it might actually be better if you just use these cloud instances because they can be deleted and, and thrown away and you don't have to worry about um, cluttering up your local machine with a bunch of software that you might not, you might not use on your own work. So I would go ahead and use the cloud instances rather than your local machine. Okay, cool. Um, well, then, without further ado, let's uh, let's just go ahead and get started. So, um, so this lesson is going to be an introduction to Conda, uh, primarily targeting data scientists, but anybody who is doing um, scientific computing, kind of of any stripe, um, can benefit from using Conda, whether it's um, you know, solving PDEs um, or partial differential equations in physical sciences or doing bioinformatics workloads um, or uh, fluid dynamic simulations or, you know, deep learning with PyTorch or 
um, or just you know, generic Python kind of Python computing, um, you will be able to benefit from learning a tool like Conda. So Conda is an open source package manager and environment management system. So it's going to solve two key problems that I'm going to go into in more detail in the first uh, in the first episode of the workshop today. But that's package management. So how do I actually get the right versions of the software that I need? And also environment management, which is how do I isolate different combinations of packages and versions from one another so I don't end up with conflicts or uh, breaking uh, or installing packages breaking you know, existing software that I need for different projects, things like this. It works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, one of the nice things about Conda that makes it really well suited for scientific computing and data science workflows is that it, it not just uh, manages Python uh, applications or Python packages, it can be used for any programming language, in particular R, Ruby, Lua, Scala, Java, JavaScript, C++, Fortran, all of these languages um, can have their packet can have packages and do have packages that are managed by Conda. So this is really really useful for a lot of scientific computing workloads that have a, a multi language uh, software stack. So machine learning and deep learning or data science applications often use Python wrappers around C, C or Fortran code, and may also require some Java or JavaScript or or scale up for front end. Um, development. A lot of bioinformatics workloads are very heterogeneous in terms of their programming languages and might use uh, Python programs, but also R or Ruby or even Perl, as well as Java within the same project. You might need all of these different software stacks to work within the same project. Um, and so that makes a tool like Conda very well suited to these kinds of workflows. So we're going to start by going through the first episode, which is just getting started with Conda, it's just the basics, like, you know, what is Conda? What is the package and management problems? Um, how can I benefit from these tools as part of my workflow? And then um, episode two, which is working with environments, is, is one of the, the key episodes from today's, uh, today's workshop. So that's where we're going to actually create Conda environments and understand how to install packages into them um, and all the basic mechanics of working with Conda. Um, we might cover quickly uh, episode three on packages and channels, or depending on time, we might skip it and go to sharing environments. And so sharing environments is um, is one of the core um, features of of uh, Conda that makes it really useful in kind of collaborative research environments for in uh, for industry practitioners who need to make sure that the software stack is um, the same across different users or different teams, uh, or even you know, sharing it with somebody who is you know, maybe a research peer at a different university on the other side of the world. So Conda has a lot of, of um, tools that allow you uh, to share your environments with other people. And then also, if we have time, we'll talk about managing GPU dependencies. Um, so this is something that uh, historically has been a real pain point for doing accelerated computing with GPUs, but it's largely now a solved problem if you use a tool like Conda. And then we'll wrap up, we'll leave some time for Q&A um, at the end, and maybe some pointers over different things, that, different places you can go from here, um, and we'll just see how it goes. Okay, so that's a quick sketch of what we're gonna do for the rest of the afternoon. Let me just glance at the chat um, and see. Okay, so we still look all good on the chat. So let's just go ahead then and over in our Jupyter Lab window, I'm gonna go ahead and click. So there's this little um, file folder here that you can kind of click to toggle this, um, what's called the left sidebar in Jupyter Lab. So I'm just gonna click that to get rid of it um, because it's, it's just taking up valuable uh, screen space um, on my screen. And then I'm just gonna click terminal. And for the most part today, we're going to be using the terminal uh, entirely, and we may do some stuff in a Jupyter notebook. Uh, we'll we'll just see how how that goes. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with Con. Okay, so this is this first episode should be fairly quick. I'm going to try to move through it quickly, um, and it just covers kind of the motivation behind why you should learn to use a tool like Con. 
Okay, so packages and environments. So first packages. So Python, like many programming languages, um, can be used to do almost anything. And Python itself, like the core Python language, is a very small program. It doesn't have a lot of, um, um, it's not big. Like it's just like a relatively small piece of, of software. The power of Python comes with the community and ecosystem of packages that can be used to extend the base Python uh, distribution to do nearly anything. But with, um, with that ecosystem, that, that large ecosystem of really useful packages comes complexity of how do I install these packages? How do I manage the packages such that installing one package doesn't install a whole bunch of other dependencies that then break some other package that I have previously installed? There's a lot of complexity here um, that is kind of just beneath the surface for most, most users and historically caused um, a huge amount of difficulty for new users to get started with, uh, with Python. Fortunately for you, those difficulties have largely been solved, not entirely solved, but largely been solved by tools like Conda. And we're gonna also talk about PIP um, a little bit later, which is another common tool within the Python only ecosystem for package management. Okay. So I mentioned the word dependencies um, in that brief description. So you might have a core package that you want to use, whether it's something like NumPy, which is um, a n-dimensional array library in Python that mimics a lot of functionality of MATLAB, of the core MATLAB, if, you, if you've used MATLAB before. Or, there might, or another package is SciPy. So SciPy has a lot of more, um, more uh, targeted or specialized scientific computing software for things like optimization, signal processing, um, some basic statistics, things that you might find in like a MATLAB like toolbox or toolkit. Most of those toolkits would be in the site, would show up in the Python ecosystem as part of the SciPy package. Now, each of these packages, so you, you might want to use NumPy or you might want to use SciPy or you might want to use PyTorch or TensorFlow or something. But each of these packages, which you want to use, requires installing a whole bunch of other dependencies. These are other packages that the package you want to use needs in order to function properly. So installing a package you want is not as simple as just installing that package. It requires installing all the dependencies of that package, plus all the dependencies of the dependencies, and so forth and so on. So for many of the commonly used uh, libraries might have dozens, many dozens of dependencies that also need to be installed um, in a consistent way. And so that complexity kind of can grow exponentially with the number of packages that you want to install. And in order to, and it can quickly get uh, very complicated and complex, and you need a tool like Conda to help kind of navigate that complexity and for the most part, just sweep it under the rug for you so you don't have to worry with it. You install the packages that you're interested in using and Conda takes care of the rest in terms of the dependencies and the dependencies, the dependencies, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the next term that I wanna define is environments. So um, I would say historically, um, I guess people are used to just installing software on a single machine. So it's installed either for a, a user on the machine or it's installed globally for all users on a particular machine if it's a multi-user uh, machine and depending on the software, things like this. So the notion of an environment is like your laptop or your workstation or, or something like that. But um, more recently um, in the Python ecosystem and, and in other programming um, ecosystems as well, there's been this move towards um, isolating software stacks for use in a particular project. And it's that isolated software stack that I mean, that's what I mean by an environment. So an environment is a collection of packages and their dependencies that are specific to a particular project. And we want, to, we want a tool that allows us, because we're typically gonna have many projects going at any particular time, we want a tool that will allow us to isolate the software stacks for each of our projects. 
such that whatever we install in one environment does not in any way interact with software that's installed in another environment that's used on another project. So that's the idea. You may have encountered the concept of a software container, maybe um, a particular implementation of containers called Docker, uh, which is one of the most widely used ones. This takes this um, isolation of the software stack level to the operating system level um, and provides even more um, isolation of the app stack all the way down to the operating system. Um, we don't need to go, uh, we, we're not going to go down to that level of granularity. For us, it will be enough to install just kind of the applications that we need and uh, take advantage of the fact that Conda works across operating systems and allow Conda to manage that operating system uh, complexity for us. But if you're interested, a more advanced topic is how can I combine um, Conda with a container tool like Docker to get um, both the user-friendliness user of a tool like Conda with the technical uh, advances of a containerized containerization solution such as Docker. But that's beyond the scope of, of today's discussion. So there's a question in the chat. So um, are dependencies installed automatically with the packages? Yes. So this is a key feature of any package management tool is that they must um, install the dependencies and all the dependencies, the dependencies and so on and so forth for the package that you want because you don't want to have to deal with keeping track of all of those yourself. What you want is to say, I want to install NumPy, or I want to install PyTorch, or I want to install TensorFlow, or I want to install Pandas, or I want to install um, SciPy. And then the tool, whether it's Conda or some other tool, needs to handle all the complexity of automatically installing everything else that you need in order to use that piece of software. So that's what you're going to learn how to do today. Okay, so um, environment management. So um, I'll kind of leave this for you to read, uh, read through on your own. Just that environment management um, is really important, solves a lot of problems. And usually when um, users here at Calst uh, that I work with and advise um, on their own, uh, on their research work or their projects or things like that, or their coursework, Usually, the thing that causes them the most trouble with their computing is not writing the code or not, um, not figuring out how to you know, get the computer to do what they want. It's environment management. So many users who, um, who haven't had an exposure to a tool like Conda are just used to installing everything onto their laptop and then stuff software works for a while, but then it breaks six months later and they don't know why. And a lot of things, um, a lot of the problems and difficulties that they struggle with, with their computing for their research is simply to do with, with environment management. Um, so learning to use uh, an effective tool or uh, effective tool for environment management, such as Conda, uh, will save you a lot of time and, and um, and tedious errors um, as you get started with your, uh, with your research work or your work in industry. Um, so there are many op options for, um, and, ah, okay, so it would appear that I have um, either talked too long such that I have lost connection to my binder instance, and now I need to get a new one. So if you're wondering what the error looks like when your, um, your instance times out, this is the type of error that you will, you will see. Um, so what I will do is, so I could see I could dismiss this, but then I can't access my, uh, my compute instance because it's, it's basically shut down in the, the background. There's nothing to connect to. So I'll just uh, close this out and go back and uh, get another one. Okay, so while that's loading, so there are other environment management systems that are that you can use in Python. So there's virtual env, pip env, vm. Uh, vm is uh, comes with the Python distribution itself, so it's kind of like the built-in version of uh, for uh, environment management systems. Um, 
A benefit of Conda is that it's not Python specific. So if you only have Python uh, dependencies, then pretty much any of these solutions will provide the same functionality. And you just pick the one that is most convenient for you. But if you are working in an environment where you have multiple programming languages as part of your software application stack, which is very common in uh, scientific computing and data science, then a tool like Conda is, is really tailored to those use cases. And some of these tools, for example, none of these tools would have the ability to manage GPU dependencies for your uh, GPU accelerated data science or machine learning or scientific computing. Uh, you would have to manage those yourself. If you're doing bioinformatics, none of these tools will have the ability to manage the non-Python dependencies that you will need in order to um, in order to solve your bioinformatics or genomics uh, workflows. Okay, but there are links here if you want to go and scope out um, what those other options are for your uh, um, for your Python-specific projects. Um, so package management, I think I've kind of mentioned the concept of package management. Um, it, if you're a Linux user, you automatically know the, what the idea of a package manager is because at, on Linux systems, the OS has its own package manager, which is used to install software for the operating system. But if you come from um, Mac or Windows, um, you're maybe may less familiar with, uh, with package management systems. Um, but the basic idea is that we want a, um, we want a single tool that will allow us to install software and manage installing all the dependencies and things like this. Um, within the Python ecosystem, there's pip and poetry. Um, so again, Conda is not the only way uh, within the Python ecosystem. Uh, these tools, if you only need to manage Python, a Python app stack, then pip and poetry or Conda are are very close substitutes and you should pick the one that you, know, you find the most intuitive. But if you need to manage a, um, a more complicated app stack with different programming languages, then I would strongly recommend that you stick with Conda. Okay. Um, so the short answer to why you should use a packaged environment management system like Conda um, is basically that it's going to save you a lot of time in the future because it's going to protect you from a lot of, um, they're not bugs, but it's just like, um, they're not bugs like software bugs, but it's, it's, it's gonna save you a lot of heartache because you will know how to install packages and their dependencies in a way that keeps them isolated from, from one another. So that you don't install software and then break software that was previously working for some other project that, that you were doing in the past, something like this. Um, so your work will be um, more productive because you won't be spending nearly as much time um, trying to figure out software installation problems. You have more time to get on with the science that you're doing. Um, it'll also be more reproducible. Your work will be more reproducible because if somebody says, hey, you know, hey, David, I would like to reproduce the the results from your previous paper, you know, what software did you use? You can say, oh, well, I used Conda to install all the software. And here's a list of the software that I used. And here's how you can use Conda to take that list of software and create the whole software app stack that you will need to run the code that, um, that I wrote to produce the results that I published in my paper. And we're going to learn how to do that today. Um, it also makes your work more portable. So, um, you know, here at Calus, I have my laptop, I have my workstation, we have, um, uh, Ibex, which is our um, our GPU accelerated cluster, we have an HPC, a Cray XC40, HPC machine, Shaheen. Um, so these are all different kinds of computing. Plus, we've got cloud. There's cloud computing uh, resources. So if I'm going to use all these different computing resources, then you know if I if I get something working on my laptop, but then I need more computing cores or I need more more storage for larger data set. How do I get the software installed that I need on these other computing systems? Well, Conda solves that problem too because it allows it'll help you port your software from uh, one machine to another or from one operating system to another, and so that makes it a very effective tool for um, again increasing your um, 
your productivity. So instead of having to spend a lot of time figuring out how to get your software installed on a remote computing system, you can just take your Conda environment file, which we'll learn how to uh, we'll learn how to put together uh, later this afternoon, and you can copy that environment file, which is just a text file, over to some remote computing system and use Conda to recreate that uh, software application stack from that file. It'll be the same software application stack that you had on your laptop or workstation. So it's very powerful for both reproducibility and portability. Okay, so there's a link to the official Conda, uh, Conda documentation. Oh, didn't mean to uh, didn't mean to click that on the same tab. So uh, you can have a read through the uh, the official documentation um, if you wish. Um, so I provided a link there for that. Um, and ah, so one last thing. So um, if you you know, if you start Googling around for Conda, you will often encounter Conda, Mini Conda, and Anaconda. Um, and the, uh, the way to think about this is the way this Venn diagram, kind of a Venn diagram that um, is laid out here. So there's the Conda tool, which is the tool that I'm going to teach you how to use for managing your uh, Python uh, or your, your software app stacks. Then there is Mini Conda. So Mini Conda is the Conda tool plus its own Python uh, version, plus some operating system specific packages. So Conda needs to use Python, but it wants to use a version of Python that is not your system Python, if you have a system version of Python installed, because that system Python needs to be kept isolated and used by the operating system. So it brings its own version of Python. And then depending on what operating system you're on, Conda needs to be able to talk to it. And so whether you're Windows, Mac, or Linux, you need slightly different um, libraries to enable Conda to talk to your operating system. So that's Mini Conda. We encourage all of our users at Calst to install Mini Conda uh, on their own work machines, their laptops, their workstations, or in their home directories um, on iBooks. Um, now, Anaconda um, was a distribution that is um, released by the, the company that develop these tools, also called Anaconda. It includes Miniconda plus several hundred packages targeting scientific computing and data science, machine learning use cases. Um, I generally discourage users from installing Anaconda because it installs a huge amount of software. And it's better to have, instead of installing one collection of a huge amount of software on your own, on your machine, to just install Miniconda and then follow the techniques that we're going to learn in the rest of this afternoon to create little environments for each of your projects that have only the software that you need for that project, rather than installing just like everything you could possibly need all in one go and taking up a lot of uh, space on your, um, on your machine. Um, there are also other downsides. I'll mention some of them as we get on uh, further to today. Um, but if, if you are confused by the differences between these three, like this is the way to keep it straight in your head. Okay. Um, right. So I, I think I've, I've kind of droned on a bit longer than I had, had wanted to for this. So I'm just going to be quiet now. So are there any questions um, about the, the basic ideas of Conda, the motivation, or like what about package management or environment management or th things like that? Um, we're going to learn how, how to solve those problems, but any questions about kind of the problems themselves, it'd be good to ask them now. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, in that case, we'll just uh, move on before my uh, system times out again. So I'm going to get my terminal back and we're going to move right along to, um, we're going to move right along to the next episode. Ah, so there is a great question in the chat. So can you mix between PIP and Conda? And the answer is yes, you can. There is a very specific um, workflow to um, productively use the two tools together. And we're going to see examples of that, um, I don't know, in about an hour, I would think. Um, but it's a very important question because not everything that you will need not every Python package that you might want will be available via Conda, but it will almost surely be available via PIP. And so sometimes you will need to use 
um, pip to install packages into your conda environment. And there's a very specific way um, of doing that that I have found eliminates a lot of problems for users. And I'll show you how to do that in this workshop. So stay tuned. OK. Episode two, working with environments. So in this episode, we're going to learn the, like, the basic things that you would expect to use Conda to do. So uh, we're going to create and delete environments. We're going to talk about activating and deactivating environments. Like, what does that mean and how do you do it? Um, we're going to install packages. Um, we're going to talk about where you should create your environments. And um, then some like uh, bookkeeping things. So like, okay, I know that I've installed NumPy and SciPy and pandas into my environment, but like, what else have I installed in that environment? Is there a way to list the contents of all the packages that have been installed in my environment? Yes, there is. I'll show you how to do that. Um, well, I've created a whole bunch of environments. How do I know what environments I've created on my machine and where are they? I'll show you how to do that. And then we'll talk about, um, again, deleting environments that you, you no longer need. OK. Um, so there are some commands here to set up your, your workspace. So this is not necessary for us. Um, so if you joined us last week, um, so some quick bash commands that we're going to need today. So if you uh, run a ls-l, which is to list the contents of the current directory, you will see that there is a directory here called introduction to conda. So we're going to use that, um, that introduction to conda directory has kind of everything that, that we need. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use the cd command to change into the introduction to conda. And you can use tab completion just by hitting tab. Uh, to get introduction to conda and hit enter. And then you'll see that the bash prompt has changed. And so now we have, we've got our cursor and then our little bash prompt. And then just the left of the bash prompt is going to be the path from the root file system down to the introduction to conda directory. And if we type pwd, we can see that we are in the slash home slash jovian, which is our fictional username in this cloud instance and the introduction to conda directory. So um, alternatively, you can actually use the file window to navigate into the introduction to conda uh, directory. And then you could launch a new terminal. So this is introduction to conda. And if you launch the new terminal, actually that doesn't, that doesn't do anything different. So just ignore that last one minute that uh, didn't do what I thought it was going to do. So this is what you need to do. You need to change into this directory, and that's it, basically. So, and then we can run ls-l and see that there's nothing there. But now we just have an empty directory that we're going to use for instructional purposes. Um, so there's a question in the chat. So can we download this folder and add it to our environment? So I'm not entirely certain what you, uh, what is meant by that. Um, so you can try to clarify your question in the chat or you can unmute yourself if you want. Um, but I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. So um, okay, so this folder that we're that I mentioned here is um, is just going to be for now. It's going to be an empty folder. We're going to install a bunch of stuff um, into um, into this directory, and we're going to talk about it. But for now, it's just going to be like an empty folder that that we're going to use to uh, to populate the stuff. So there shouldn't be anything in. Okay, okay. So a conda environment. So what is a conda environment? I've been saying environment over and over again. So a conda environment is, is just going to be a directory. So just like any other directory or folder that you're used to you know, using on your computer, a conda environment is simply a directory. 
it's a, it's a directory that has a specific structure in terms of subdirectories and files and things like that. The, the details of which are interesting, but beyond the scope of, of today, we can just think of it as a directory. So when we, when we talk about um, creating Conda environments, we're basically going to be creating directories and installing software into that directory. And we'll see later when we delete Conda environments, what we're really doing is effectively just deleting a directory. So that's the underlying concept. OK, um, so Conda has a default environment, which is called the base environment. And so this is what you get when you install mini Conda. It comes with the base environment, which includes uh, Conda and then Python and some operating system specific packages. You do not want to install packages into your base environment. And the reason is that um, installing packages into your base environment often has undesirable side effects, such as breaking your, uh, your base environment um, and making Conda um, potentially unusable. Uh, and the reason for that is that the base environment is designed to do one thing, which is give you access to the Conda tool in a way that can interact with your operating system. It's not meant to be um, it's meant to be its own separate environment. It's not meant to have every possible configuration of software that you might want to use all in one little environment. Okay, so don't install things into your base environment. Okay, so let's uh, let's create an environment. Um, so there is a simple command that you can use to create an environment, and it is the conda create command. So if we do conda create and then when you create environments, you typically might give them a name or we'll see something called a prefix, which is actually just a path to the directory where you want to uh, create your content environment, but we'll give it a name uh, just to get started. So let's suppose that we want to give, um, let me just expand this terminal a little bit so we have everything on the line. So let's suppose that we want to, we're going to create just a Python 3 environment. And so we'll do Python 3 env, dash env, something like this. The name, you can pick your name. I try to pick names that are, um, are descriptive of what the environment is supposed to be. So often if I have a project name in mind, I'll do project name dash environment, something, or dash env, something like this, followed by space. And then one or more packages that we want to install. So in this case, we're just going to install Python. And so then we hit enter. And now um, the Conda tool is going off to the internet and it's pulling down um, data on packages. And then it, once it's done gathering all the data on the packages that you want to install, plus their dependencies and the dependencies of the dependencies and so on and so forth, um, it prints out what's called a, a package plan, which just kind of tells you how what software needs to be installed, um, and then ask you to confirm whether or not you want to install the software. So if you have an older version of Conda, you'll get a little warning that says, um, you know, please update your Conda version. And I'll show you, there's a command to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to do that uh, a little later. Um, actually, they tell you the command right here. So you just run that command and it will update your, your Conda version. Um, so the package plan includes the environment location. So remember I said every Conda environment is actually a directory. Hmm, that's annoying. Okay, so if this is happening to you, so I'm using the, the Counts Binder Hub and there seems to be some type of, of uh, uh, like a reset connection or drop connection going on. So I'm just gonna switch to using the public uh, Binder Hub and could be connectivity issues from my, um, from my house here at Cals where I'm broadcasting live um, or something else. Um, I'll have to talk with my colleagues at Research Computing IT about that. So let me just get caught back up. Okay. So I get my terminal. And now I will do, I will change into introduction to Conda. And then I will do Conda 
create name Python three environment Python hit enter. Okay, so we're running off gathering all this information. Okay, so where were we? So the environment location. So I remember I said the con environment is just a directory. Well, the environment name becomes the directory name. And then the directory lives uh, in a default location and which can on these binder hub instances that default location is inside the uh, ims emvs directory which is inside conda which is inside this root directory called srv um, on if you install many conda on your own machine then many conda will install in your home directory and inside of many conda there will be an EMVS EMS directory, and the default location will be directories inside of that uh, EMVS directory. Okay. Um, and then the update, the added specs. So this will just be the, the packages that you want to install will be listed here. So we only have Python, that's it. But look at all the dependencies that need to be downloaded and installed. So here's a Python. So it's only you know a 27 meg uh, installation. And so it's a very small piece of software. Um, but it installs the Python uh, 3.9, which is the um, a newish version of Python. It installs pip. Uh, and then these other libraries are dependencies of Python that are required for the operating system on which this Python is running. So in this case, it's going to be running on Linux. And so all of these are kind of like Linux OS specific things that are required for Python to run or other um, other Python dependencies like SQLite is a, uh, a lightweight uh, SQL database implementation, things like this. So down here, um, you'll get a list of the exact specific packages that will be installed, and then you're asked to confirm yes or no. And if you just hit Y for yes and hit enter, then what actually happens is that Conda downloads the packages. So up until here, Conda was just saying, okay, I've worked out all the packages that need to be installed and all their dependencies. And I want you to confirm that you do want to install these things. And then once you say yes, it runs off, downloads the packages, installs the software, and then tells you that, okay, if you want to activate this environment, then this is the command that you need to use, Conda activate Python 3 environment. And then the command to deactivate the environment. Okay, so cool. So um, we created an environment, just a Python 3 environment, but what if you need a, a specific version of Python 3? So uh, by default, Conda ran off and grabbed the most recent version of Python that uh, is available, which was Python 3.9 uh, present. But what if you need an older version? Like for a while, TensorFlow would only work with Python 3.6. So you can actually modify an environment by providing version numbers. So we can do Python equals 3.6. And then maybe we change our environment name to uh, maybe Python 3.6 and hit enter. So now the same machinery goes on in the background. So here, um, now we're going to be downloading Python 3.6. Um, and then this Python ABI and then set up tools. But notice how there's not as much software that's been downloaded. And the reason for that is, that, but all of this software is being installed. And the reason is that if you compare this list of software here that needs to be downloaded, a lot of these dependencies are compatible with Python 3.6. And so there's no need to re-download them and reinstall them because they're already there. And Conda has confirmed that the existing libraries are good enough for, are good and will work with Python 3.6. So there's no need to duplicate all that effort. So the only things that are downloaded are three packages, but all of this software is installed. Um, so there's no, they're basically, Conda, the, the takeaway is that Conda is, is clever in terms of minimizing the amount of downloads and software installation that has to be done. If it can reuse existing software, it will do so. 
So again, we can just hit yes or Y for yes and hit enter. Okay. Um, so while this is downloading, so I generally, I like to specify version numbers uh, for packages when I want to install them, because that, that means that I have a better record of, of what packages are actually being used. Um, uh, once you've you know, been working with the same packages over and over again, you'll start to get a feel for like what the current version numbers are. Um, but if you don't know, Conda has this handy search feature. Um, so I'm just gonna clear, use the clear command to clear out this terminal window. But uh, there's a search feature in Conda where you can search for the package name. So uh, scikit-learn, for example. So scikit-learn is a, a machine learning library uh, for Python. Um, uses what I, I think of as being like classical uh, machine learning techniques. So not deep learning, um, but other forms of, of machine learning. So Conda is going through and it's, it's looking for software that matches this pattern of scikit-learn and then it's going to return a list of all the available versions. Okay, so um, the most recent version appears to be scikit-learn 0.24. And if you go back, you can see that there's quite a lot of versions of scikit-learn. Um, you'll see different, um, uh, for example, you'll see the same version number appears like a whole bunch of times, right? So here is, and there's even three more here that I missed. So this has the same version number, but different build numbers. And the build numbers correspond to uh, versions of the library for a different version of Python. So you'll see in here, so there's Python 2.7. So this is an older version of scikit-learn that is compatible with Pyth Python 2. Um, then there's Python 3.5, Python 3.6, Python 3.7. Um, and then you don't see any more recent versions of Python. So actually, if you needed scikit-learn 0.20, you would have to use Python 3.7 or, or earlier. Um, sometimes uh, libraries will, will be, uh, so scikit-learn depends on a lot of compiled uh, C and C++ code. Um, so that C and C++ code will use some like low level linear algebra routines. And sometimes um, different builds of these packages will be compiled to use different versions of these low level linear algebra routines, things like this. So that's why if you're wondering why you have the same version number, but all the different build numbers, well, that's, that's the reason. Okay, so that's how you can figure out what versions are available. Um, so let's do something a bit more complicated. So I'm, I'm just going to clear clear this out again. So let's install. Uh, let's create another environment. So conda create, and I will call this the basic SciPy environment. Um, and I'm going to install. I'm going to install these packages, but I'm actually, for the purposes of, of today, I'm going to leave off the version numbers in part because the, um, I want to see, in part because I like to see kind of how much uh, drift there has been since I last refreshed these, uh, these lecture notes. So we're going to have IPython, matplotlib, numpy, and scipy. Um, so I will list, um, IPython, mat, plot, lib, uh, numpy, and scipy. Um, and actually something that's kind of handy that you can do is um, you can write a multi-line command um, in, uh, in your terminal by using this uh, backslash. Uh, I didn't do what I wanted it to do, sorry. Um, I'm going to control, so I use control C to, to kind of kill that off. So I'm gonna do conda create uh, basic scipy environment, and then the backslash and hit enter, and then ipython backslash matplotlib, and if the watch out for typos, 
NumPy. You don't have to do this. I'm just doing it because I. Um, and then the last the last line you leave off the slash, and you hit enter. Um, maybe that makes it more legible for you instead of something like like this that runs over, wraps around. So here, uh, we're installing more packages. So you can see that um, quite a lot more packages are being installed here. So we we asked for only um, uh, four packages, but something like, I don't know, just glancing at that, maybe like 30 to 40 packages are actually installed. And so this is what I meant by that kind of an exponential explosion in complexity as you as you need more and more packages as part of your uh, software stack the number of dependencies and dependencies of dependencies kind of can grow exponentially so it becomes uh, a challenging problem to manage all of these by hand um, and you I mean you just couldn't do it you couldn't manage it by hand but if you look through this list you'll find so there's matplotlib uh, there's numpy um, Where's SciPy? So SciPy is here. So note that we didn't actually list Python. We listed IPython, which is short for Interactive Python, which is a particular implementation of the Python interpreter that allows for um, you know, better support for, it's just a, a, a more natural development environment than a, a basic Python uh, interpreter. We'll talk more about that next week. Um, but we didn't actually list Python. But because Python is a dependency of IPython, it gets installed as well. And if we look through here, and somewhere, um, so note that Python is not listed in the packages that will be downloaded because Python has already been downloaded. So we've already built two Python environments, one of which had Python 3.9. And if we go through the list of packages that will be installed, we will find uh, Python. So there's the Python 3.9. If you need to finish, call you then, okay? Because Madame Abrar can delve in. Bye-bye. All right. So please uh, try to keep yourself on mute uh, as much as possible to minimize the background disruptions. Um, okay. So, so you'll see here's Python in the list of software that's going to be installed. So if we go down here and we sit, hit yes, now, Conda is going to install um, uh, install all of these packages and things. So in general, Conda is pretty efficient at, at downloading and installing things. But if you're working with really big environments, like sometimes when you you know ask Conda to go and build your environment, it's a good time to go and get a cup of tea or coffee or go for a walk, stretch your legs come back and it'll be done. You know, generally when I'm working with, uh, with users here at Calus on a, on a piece of, on a production software project might have um, two or 300 packages that are required, um, which might end up being three or 400 packages that actually need to be downloaded and installed. And uh, those kinds of content environment builds can take you know, 30 minutes to over an hour sometimes to, to complete. Um, fortunately, you generally only have to do that a very few number of times, like maybe once for your project. And then um, obviously if you move to a different computer, you have to rebuild your environment again, but that's not such a big deal. Okay, so then we're done. And then we're told we can activate this environment by using the command conda activate with the name of the environment. Okay, so some people are saying they're getting an error. Solving environment failed. We'll retie with the next repo data source. So does it um, does it actually then not finish, or does it just say that, but then eventually it gets the next repo data and um, is able to complete? Solving environment killed. Um, Hmm. Well, that shouldn't happen unless uh, unless you actually killed it because you got tired of waiting. Um, can I ask you to say whether you're using um, 
Um, if you are getting these errors, can you say whether you're using the Calc Finder Hub or the Public Finder Hub? Public. Public. Okay. Do you want to try? Just try the command again uh, and see if you get the the same. Um, because I'm using the public myself right now. Um, three times and it's killed. Huh. So for those of you who are having problems, can you do so? Abdul Rahman listed out the, the kind of the URL to uh, the binder instance where he was um having the problems and his says hub.mybinder.turing.ac.uk can those of you who are having problems copy and paste the same so it might like for me you can see here at the top for me it says hub oops um it says hub uh, gk2.mybinder.org so if you if you're having a problem with conda then um if you could copy and paste that Okay, so it seems many people are having problems. Yeah, so the, the actual, um, again, if you could copy and paste whatever this says for you on the public binder hub, then I can pass this information along to um, my colleagues at the binder hub federation and they can try to figure out what is going on. So this URL here tells you on which cloud infrastructure your instance is running. So it seems like, for example, uh, Abdul Rahman and chat posted hub.mybinder.turing.ac.uk. So that's the, um, that's the Turing Institute in the UK. That's their cloud, uh, or that's their binder hub instance. So his, his um, compute instance was running in the UK on their, their infrastructure. So that means that there might be some setting that's not quite right on their infrastructure. Um, but obviously on mine, Okay, so Diego is running on the same place that I am, which is actually on Google's. So GKE2 is Google Kubernetes Engine 2, which is the uh, donated cloud computing resources that Google has provided. And mine seems to work, but Diego's is not working. Okay, um, for the moment, all I can do is say, well, close your browser tab and try to get a new compute instance. And, um, and try again, because it's working for me. And off the top of my head, I can't quickly troubleshoot this for you. So just close your browser tab, um, go back, click one of these buttons again, probably the public Jupyter lab, click that one and try again. Um, so it seems to be a bit inconsistent. Um, the other thing that you could do, ah, so you could try this. Um, so you could try updating the Conda version here. So if you, let's just copy this. So let's talk about that now. I don't think that this is going to solve the problem, but it might. So let's let's give it a try. Um, so I'm just going to clear, clear this out. So this is the command to update. Um, a package in Conda. So it's Conda update, and then you provide the name um, or the prefix, and we'll talk about prefixes later, of the, of the environment where you want to update the package. So that's the base package in this case. So this is like the only time you will ever have dash dash name base is when you're updating Conda and then Conda. And then if we hit enter, then this will go and grab the most recent version of Conda. And maybe for those of you who are having uh, having issues, maybe this will help solve them. Um, and again, you'll get this is the package plan. Um, there's some other stuff that's a little different here, but we don't need to be bothered by that. Uh, and we'll just hit yes and hit enter. Um, so there's a question in the chat. Can I install these on a PC which has only CPU and not GPU? Yes, you can. Um, 
Um, nothing here is nothing we're installing right now has anything to do with GPU computing. It's all CPU computing. When, if we get to the lesson on GPU libraries, then I'll talk about that. Um, and you will be able to install the GPU libraries here in this cloud instance, which will be a Linux instance that doesn't actually have access to GPUs. You can still install the software for GPUs, but you just wouldn't be able to use it because there's no actual GPU that's been attached to this compute instance. Okay, so for those of you who um, were having problems, were you able to update Conda? And can you try running, um, I guess it would have been uh, this command again to create the basic sci-fi environment and see if it works now, just out of curiosity. All right, so while I'm waiting to hear back from uh, those users who are having a bit of trouble, so I'll talk about activating um, uh, an environment. Okay, so it looks like the same. So, okay, so about all I can recommend at this point um, is that you close the browser tab, get a new compute instance and try, um, and try and see if it works again because it seems to be some intermittent issue because it's working for many users but not for some of you and it's working for me and i've exhausted kind of my ideas of what could be the problem um that i could possibly troubleshoot here on the fly so apologies but just start over okay um while you're doing that though um before i talk about activating environment so why don't you go ahead and get a get some practice creating your own Conda environment. So there's an exercise here to create a new environment called machine learning environment. So create this machine learning environment um, and install the libraries I have listed here. IPython, Matplotlib, Pandas, Numba, and Scikit-Learn. And there's links here to the different projects. If you want to read about them, you can click these links and, and learn more about the projects, but see the documentation, things like that. Um, this number project in particular is, um, is pretty cool. So I'll just mention it, uh, quickly. So number is, um, a, a package that will compile your Python code down into optimized, uh, machine code that will target specific hardware, including GPUs. Um, so, for example, instead of having to learn to write low-level you know, C or C++ code, you can just write a Python function and then you know, have a couple of import statements followed by what's called a decorator in Python. And Numba will compile this Python function down into optimized machine code, which will be as performant or at least nearly as performant as optimized native C or C++ code that um, an expert C or C++ coder may have written. Um, so it, it's been a game changer uh, for many people in scientific computing um, in terms of, of really unleashing a lot of the power of um, hardware, uh, CPU or GPU hardware without having to actually learn to write low level code. Um, and, and many people don't know about it. So that's why I wanted to highlight this one here. So this is a particularly interesting library to, to look at um, that's less well known than IPython, Matplotlib, Pandas, and Scikit-Learn, all of which we are going to use next week in the Python and uh, the introduction to Python course. So if you could just take a look at creating this environment. Um, and I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a moment. And I will do the exercise. Um, and in the meantime, you can, if you have questions, you can unmute yourself. Um, if you're trying to get caught up, then this is a good time. You can kill your compute instance, try to get another one and, um, and get caught up again. Uh, you probably don't need to recreate all the environments we already created. Um, so just kind of jump back to, um, you know, creating these new environments. So you might want to try the basic SciPy environment since that seemed to cause problems. Um, the other thing that could have been the problem. So if you, if you added 
so if you added these version numbers, then maybe that was the problem. Maybe these version numbers are no longer compatible. So let, let's see what happens. Just out of curiosity. Um, let's see what happens if I try this. Uh, I'll just rename this other. So Ah, so maybe this is the error that everybody was getting. So you tried to create it with the uh, with these version numbers. That might be the problem. Maybe these maybe something um, um, maybe something has drifted since I last updated these notes and uh, and these ver or something or there's a typo in these version numbers or something. So for those of you who, who ran into trouble, if you could try running the command without the actual version numbers. So in fact, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna manually kill. Ah, okay. So now it seems like I have actually replicated the issue. So if you could just rerun the command without the version numbers. So it would look like this. So just leave off the version numbers and let give conda the freedom to choose the, ver the right version numbers and then it should work okay oh shoot i just realized i had stopped sharing my screen that's no good um let me share my screen again so here i ran this command which to be fair is exactly what's written in the lecture notes and i think i got the error that everybody was or that some of you were getting. And there must be a typo in my lecture notes or something has shifted such that these version numbers are no longer compatible. So that this is an example of, of the type of error that you would get um, if the version numbers were not compatible. Uh, but if you run the command um, as I did it and leave off the version numbers, so he, see how this, uh, this command here, I just left off the version numbers, then it should work. So please try that. Um, in the meantime, so um, so yes, just like that, Abdul Rahman. So uh, someone is getting uh, command con not found. Yes. So if you're working on your local on your local machine and you've not installed uh, Miniconda then you won't be able to use the conda command because it's not installed on your machine. Um, so there are some instructions in the setup page for today's lecture notes that will explain how to do that or how to install Miniconda. Um, but I would just advise you for today's workshop, just for ease, just to use the cloud instances. Um, OK, good. I'm glad it's working for everybody. I was, I was a little worried about that. It would have been first major malfunction. Um, Okay, cool. Okay, well now that we've now that we've sorted that out, so let's actually complete the uh, the solution or the solution of the exercise. So this is just a bit more involved, um, and there's an example without version numbers and with version numbers. Um, given the problems with version numbers that uh, we've seen so far, um, it looks like a, a refresh of these teaching notes is in order. So why don't you go ahead and uh, for the rest of today, just leave off the version numbers. I think that that gives Conda the freedom to choose, and that um, ought to result in correct, or that will result in correct version numbers in case there are any other typos that I, I missed in my lecture notes. So if we create an environment named the machine learning environment, and then we add uh, I Python. Uh, matplotlib, pandas, python, scikit-learn, and number. So the order in which you list these things doesn't matter. 
Um, I often, although not always, clearly will uh, list things in uh, alphabetical order, uh, but that's not necessary. Um, the order is irrelevant. So I hit enter. And off we go. So while that's completing, I'm just going to keep keep going. Um, so we're going to talk about the, the next two commands that we're going to learn are activating and deactivating environments. Uh, so let me go back over here. So I hit Y for yes, and hit enter. Um, so there's a great question in the chat. So once I've installed my package as an environment on my local machine, can I access it from my IDE like PyCharm? So yes, um, PyCharm will have some documentation on how to make it um, aware of Conda environments. So PyCharm works very well with Conda, um, but you'll need to refer to the PyCharm documentation on how to um, make PyCharm aware of your Conda environments. Um, the Microsoft Visual Studio Code also works very well with Conda. Um, if you use that as your IDE, um, uh, JupyterLab as well. We'll I'll show you some examples of that uh, later. Okay, so now that we've created this environment, um, let's activate it. So whenever you create an environment at the very end of the logs, uh, which is like the output, uh, it tells you if you want to activate this environment, then you need to use the command uh, conda activate, and then the name um, or prefix, which we'll get to later, machine learning environment. So now I'm going to activate the machine learning environment. And when I do that, the name of the active environment pops up over here. And so now, um, um, if I want to deactivate the environment, I can do conda deactivate. And that takes me out of the environment. And here on these binder instances, they have a special environment called notebook that is kind of the environment for um, um, the cloud instance, because this, this um, binder hub also uses Conda under the hood to manage the software stack that I've created for the whole workshop. So here we're kind of using Conda to create an environment inside of an environment that already exists. Um, but we don't need to worry about that right now. So it's just Conda activate switches you to a new environment. Conda deactivate takes you out of that environment, possibly back to the previous environment or back to the base environment. Uh, so for example, uh, we could do Conda deactivate here to deactivate the notebook environment and take us back to the base environment. And then we could go to conda activate the notebook environment, back to the notebook environment, uh, conda uh, deactivate to go back to the base environment, conda activate uh, machine learning environment. go to the machine learning environment, so on and so forth. OK, um, so I've just showed you a lot of examples of activating and deactivating. Um, it's easy to switch back and forth. You just use these conda activate and deactivate commands. I do see a lot of users, though, um, forget which conda environment is active. So. Um, over here on the left-hand side will typically be the name of the environment. Um, and just keep an eye on that, because that will tell you which environment is active. Because sometimes users install the package, and then they try to use the package, and it doesn't work. And then they get confused, and they realize, oh, actually, I installed the package in a particular environment, but I didn't activate that environment before I tried to use the package. Errors like this. So just pay attention to the environment type is active. Um, that will save you a bit of trouble. OK, um, just quickly, so installing a package into an existing environment. 
So if we select to deactivate this environment, um, so if we now if we activate the basic uh, SciPy environment, okay. Now in the basic SciPy environment, um, uh, we didn't install Numba. So if you if you go back up here to where we, um, uh, so here's our basic SciPy environment. So we didn't list Numba, and Numba isn't a dependency of any of these libraries, so it's not going to be installed. Um, so we can install Numba as an example of how to install a package into an existing environment. So we've activated the environment, and now if we just do conda install Numba. So now what Conda will do is it will, it will analyze your current environment and it will try to go off and find a version of Numba that is compatible with all the software that's installed in your existing environment. And if it finds one, it will download it and install it for you. So that's what's happened here. So uh, Conda has run off and figured out that Numba version 0.53.1 is compatible with your current environment it just needs these other packages, LLVM Lite, and this low-level lib LLVM, these particular versions. And so we can just say yes and hit enter. And Conda will install Numba into the basic SciPy environment. So there's a question in the chat. So how can we see packages be installed when creating an environment? Great question. Um, and I believe we are going to talk about that in just a minute. So hold that thought for just a moment. Um, so we could do another one. So just as another example, if we wanted to do conda install scikit-learn. So we could install scikit-learn into this basic SciPy environment. Um, so there's some, some fancy options. Um, that you can use, you know, for example, like uh, if you install a package into an environment, by default, Conda will potentially change the versions of packages in your environment if it needs to in order to install the new package that you want to install. Um, it will always tell you that it needs to do that, but it will, by default, it will, it will always try to do that. You can use this freeze installed option to force Conda to fail if it needs to make any changes to the existing environment. So that can be useful if you're really happy with a with the environment you have, but you want to try installing this new package. But you want to make sure that when I install this new package, I don't screw up my existing environment or I don't change it in any not not screwed up. Sorry, let me back up. If you want, if you really like your current environment and you don't want anything to change but you do want to try to install a new package, then you can use this freeze install option. And when you do conda install numba freeze installed, it will, conda will install numba if it can find a version that require, that does not require making any changes to your environment. And if it cannot find a version of numba that, um, that it can install, then it will fail and tell you I couldn't do it. Anyway, you can read the docs if it's a bit confusing of, uh, of a description, but that's the, the basic idea. So uh, great question. So what will happen if I create a new environment while another environment is active? Will it create a sub environment or a separate environment in the root directory? Um, so if you create a new environment, it just creates a new environment, whether you're uh, whether you have a environment active or not. So like there's no concept of a sub environment. It's always going to create a separate environment in, uh, in the kind of default location. Um, so no worries about, you know, running a conda create uh, command whilst there's another environment active. And do I need to explicitly deactivate an environment before activating a new environment? So I, so the short answer is no. However, I almost always do. Um, and that's mostly just because it's just habit. It's just habit. Um, intuitively, it seems like you should need to do it. And so I just tend to do it. Um, but in practice, I'm unaware of it being an actual requirement. Okay. 
Um, so let me talk about um, okay, really quickly, um, and then we're going to uh, take a short break. So let's, uh, and then I'll, I'll let you kind of circle back. You can look at these. Um, so let's talk about where content environments live. So um, by default, uh, content environments will live in this EMVS folder. Uh, so this will either be in the Miniconda 3 or Anaconda 3 directory. If you've installed Miniconda or Anaconda on your, um, on your local machine, um, and whether that's on Windows, Mac, or, or Linux, um, on Binder, they're in the slightly different location uh, for reasons that are, are not obvious to me. But if we um, list the contents of this directory, so slash SRV, uh, Conda, and EMVS, uh, you can see, so here are all these um, environment. These are all just the directories that contain the environments that we've created. So you can see that that's, that's where they live. Um, so if you want to specify the location of a Conda environment, um, then you, instead of providing a name, you can provide a path uh, to the target directory where you want to create this environment. And this is, is typically what I actually do um, in my own projects. So um, for example, let me just clear this out. Um, in my own work, I might do something like the following. So I'll just... Uh, deactivate this environment. Um, don't need to do that. It's just a, just a habit that I have gotten into. So I will typically, if I'm starting a new project, I will do something like, I will use the make jerk command to make um, some new project directory. And then I will change into my new project directory. And then I will say, okay, well, I need a new conda environment from my new project. And so I will do conda create prefix, and then the, I will always create my content environment in a subdirectory of my project directory called env. And so here I'm just passing uh, the path from dot, which is the current directory, to the subdirectory that I want to create for my content environment. So that's slash env. And then I want to install ipython matplotlib. Um, what else? Uh, pandas and Python. So this is going to run off and do same old, same old. Um, I'll say yes. OK, so while that's installing, so th there's a, a couple of, of benefits of, of kind of always following this, like new project, new directory, and always create your Conda environment, the subdirectory called EMV. Uh, and the reason for doing that is it helps with project isolation. So now all of your project files are in one place, but so is your entire software stack. They're in that same inside your project directory. Um, and it also means that you, you basically have to remember basic, the same commands on every project. It's um, uh, Conda create with a prefix, and then this is the same prefix that you use for all of your environments. Then you list all the packages you want to install, and then it's just the same activate command over and over again. So if I wanted to activate this environment, I just pass the, uh, the path to the environment, and then instead of a name, now I get this really long uh, path out here, which is kind of annoying uh, for the prompt, but um, it, it is it is what it is, um, but this is what this is the the um, the template that I follow on on my own work. So correct, we did not. So Abdul Rahman asked, we didn't specify any particular name. That's correct. So you can either provide a name or a prefix. Or, so then, if you provide a name, then the conda environment will be installed in the default location. And we talked about the, we just talked about the default location um, up here. However, you don't have to install Conda environments in the default location. Um, in fact, for IBEX users, we discourage people from installing Conda environments in the default location, instead encourage them to install 
the Conda environments inside their uh, project directories on their Ibex Scratch directories because those are much more performant than the Ibex Home directories. Um, that's an aside that's relevant for CalS users. Um, but so I tend to not install in the default location and rather always just provide a prefix install into a particular directory. Um, okay, so there's an exercise here where you can practice that. Um, what do I want to talk about next? Uh, so listing environments. All right, so let me uh, conda deactivate. Let me clear this out. So there was a question earlier about, uh, about this. So how do you list environments? So there's a, a command, a conda, and a subcommand emv list. This lists all the environments um, that you have. Um, and it also has a little star next to the environment that's currently active. So now we have the base environment that is active. We have all these other environments that we created by name. So the basic SciPy environment, machine learning environment, notebook. We didn't create the notebook that was created by Binder. Then the Python 3, Python 3.6. OK. Um, then there was this environment, which we just created where we didn't give it a name. So this is blank over here. But note that it's in a different location. So it's in our home directory inside Introduction to Conda, inside our new project directory, and then EMV. OK. Uh, listing the contents of a directory. So how do I do that? Um, so if you do uh, conda list name and then the name of the conda environment, then you'll get a printout of all the packages that are installed plus the version numbers in the second column, plus the build numbers in the third column, and then something called the channels in the final column. We'll talk about that maybe after the break. Um, so similarly, uh, if you want to look at the contents of a condo environment that you specified um, by prefix, prefix, and then you need to provide the path to the environment. So that can be either an absolute path or a relative path. Um, let me just control C this. So since we're in the new project directory, and here's our conda environment here, it's just a subdirectory, I can just do conda list prefix dot slash env. And that does the same. It gives me the contents of the conda environment that is installed in this directory. Um, Yes. Uh, so uh, someone in the chat has another option for me to just clear that out. Another option. Um, there's a command. Um, so let's actually look at the conda help menu. I didn't do this earlier. So there's a, a bunch of different conda commands. So we've looked at uh, create um, and install. Uh, there's also an info. Um, and so if you do conda info, Um, and then you can see that there is um, some options for this conda info command. One of them is dash e or dash dash ims. So you can do conda info ims. Um, and that gives you the same as conda EMB lists. So two different ways of accessing the same information. Um, OK, so um, removing environments. So there's the conda remove command. Um, so let's suppose that, so remember, we created this conda environment here in the subdirectory. Let's suppose that. Um, I don't know, we wanted to completely start over, or we just want to delete this conda environment for whatever reason. We can do conda remove um, prefix, oops, emp um, 
and then instead of um instead of there's a shorthand to delete the entire content environment which is just to do dash dash all you can remove individual packages i almost never do that um if i if i break my content environment or i do something that i didn't want to do install a package that i didn't want i just tend to start all over and just rebuild the whole thing from scratch um i find that just rebuilding things from scratch gives you the most consistent outcome um, and saves you having to you know, troubleshoot some esoteric uh, errors that are um, can sometimes be tricky to troubleshoot. They're rare, but when they happen, they're hard to uh, troubleshoot. So I'll just so it will then when you run this remove command, it will basically say, okay, well here's the path to the environment that you've asked me to remove. And then the following package will be removed. And so this is basically all the packages that are in that environment. And you just say yes. And when it's done, if I was to do um, ls, so you can see now that EMV directory has also been deleted. So they deleted all the packages plus the directory containing the conda environment. And then if we did something like uh, conda emv list, that seems All right, let's just try uh, conda info. Well, this is bizarre. I have no idea what has happened. Clearly something has gone wrong. Let's try, let's try this. So I'm gonna close this terminal window. I'm gonna get a new one. Okay, uh, conda. Okay. Not sure what happened there. Something went screwy in my terminal session. So the way that I solved that problem was to just close the um, close this terminal window and get a new one. And you could see that all the work that I did persisted between the terminal sessions. And that's because as long as this this compute instance is is live, it's storing all this data data locally. And so you can see. So before we had this this uh, environment that had no name but had this prefix over here, and then I removed that previously and so it's gone um and i guess i could do a conda remove by name python 3 environment all yes okay and now let's try the same thing And so now you can see, so up here, we had this, this Python 3 environment, and then I removed it by name here. And then down here, you can see that it, it's gone now from the, the list of environments. Now, you might wonder like, well, what would happen if I just went and manually deleted, like say this directory? Well, if you manually deleted that directory, it would be kind of like removing the content environment, but um because you just did it manually conda would kind of still think that this uh this environment still existed 
and you would get an error if you tried to activate it. So if you want to remove an environment, don't just delete the directory, use the conda remove command, because that will cleanly remove it in a way that conda is aware. OK, so this is one of the, I, this, I know that this episode went on for quite a while, but we covered mm, a good chunk of what you need um, Um, what you need to use with um, the basics of Conda. So Conda create, Conda remove, Conda activate, deactivate, Conda install, um, and then Conda environment list to list environments, Conda list um, to list contents of environment, um, um, things like that. Okay, so any questions uh, real quick? And if not, then we're gonna take uh, maybe a 10 minute break and come back around three o'clock and pick up with the, the next episode. Okay, so I don't see any questions in chat um, and no one has unmuted themselves to ask questions. I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording um, and then I'll see you at around, uh, around three. Uh, and so we'll just take a nice break. Um, if you get a coffee, get a tea. Um, have a bio break and I'll see you back here in about 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. So I've started the recording again. Uh, let me share my screen and we'll just kind of pick up where, where we left off. I'm just going to clear this out and we'll move on to the next episode. Okay. Um, so this episode is about packages and channels. It's gonna be a lot shorter. Uh, at least we're gonna move through it a bit more quickly. Um, so the topics of this episode, we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna define what is a conda channel and what is a conda package. And, and then um, talk about why you should be explicit about what channels you use for your research project. And then what should you do if a Python package isn't available via any conda channel? So we're gonna, the, the basic idea is um, I want to explain to you where, where um, packages come from when you install them using Conda and how you can specify to install specific packages from specific locations. Okay, so a Conda package, so this is the thing that Conda downloads and then installs, is, is just a compressed archive. It's a tar uh, bzip2 uh, archive, and it contains some system level libraries might contain Python or some other modules, um, maybe some executable programs and other, um, other components. There's some metadata and a collection of files. And so that's what's inside this, this archive. And when you download it and then unarchive it, it will expand into something that will have this kind of structure. And you don't really need to understand the structure too much. Um, this is what the PyTorch version 1.1.0 built for Python 3.6 archive looks like inside. Um, but this is just what a Python package is. And so when you, in, you download, uh, when you use Conda to install packages, it goes off and grabs these archives and then it unarchives them into a directory, which is your Conda environment. And then um, each of these packages has a specific structure that looks like this. Uh, right. Okay. So Conda channels. Um, so there's some links here to the documentation. Um, a Conda channel is, is basically just a website or URL that hosts these, uh, these archives, these Conda packages. So it's basically like you, when you say, when you tell Conda to install packages from a particular channel, it's kind of like pointing Conda uh, towards a particular website and saying, go and download uh, the archives from that particular website. So there are two defaults channels, a uh, main and R, um, which is a repository of R Conda packages. Um, so if you use R, you can also manage your packages using Conda. Um, the channel that I want to really make you aware of is the Conda Forge channel. So uh, Conda Forge, so there's a link here. So let's just open that in a new tab. 
I think of Conda Forge as being like, um, actually, here's the, uh, the full website here. Um, uh, Conda Forge is like, uh, I think of it as like Wikipedia, but for software. Um, so it has become like a one-stop shop for open source software. Um, and it's a huge collection of packages across all kinds of scientific disciplines. Um, and it's usually like the place to, to start when installing software. Um, so how do you install uh, packages from a specific channel? Well, there's a channel option. So um, instead of using the commands here from the notes, so what if I do a conda activate Python uh, 3.6 environment. And then let's suppose that I want to install uh, SciPy um, from the Conda Forge channel. So by specifying the Conda Forge channel, that means that SciPy or Conda will look in the Conda Forge channel first for the SciPy package, a particular version of the SciPy package that can be installed into this Python 3.6 environment. And if it finds it, it will download it and install it. Okay. Um, so here, there's some other examples here. Um, of installing packages um, from specific channels. You can install by name or by, you can, so you can either install into the active environment, oops, sorry, you can install into the active environment. That's this example here. Um, you can install into a, an environment by name. So even if the environment's not active, you can still install into it by name. You can also install by prefix as well. Um, so we didn't talk about these possibilities in the previous episode, but those are also options. So there's a question in the chat. So if we don't mention the package version, is it possible that other packages might not be compatible with the latest version of the package installed? So uh, the short answer is no. So if you don't list the version, Conda will go and find the most recent version that is compatible with the existing packages in the environment. So it will never install something that is incompatible with the packages in your environment. It'll just error and give you an error message. Um, so you may have noticed that um, there's a, uh, whenever you create a Conda environment, you see a solving environment and it, there's a little icon that just kind of spins around. Well, what Conda is doing is it's trying to determine, it's trying to find a version of a package that's compatible with your environment. And only after it has solved that problem, will it say, yes, I can install this package or no, I can't. So you never have to worry about getting packages installed that are inconsistent with the, um, the existing environment. Okay. Um, so here's an example of a uh, channel priority. So you can pass the channel, uh, multiple times and, um, channel, channel priority just means the order in which Conda will look in channels before, um, uh, before moving to the next channel. So channel priority decreases from, uh, from left to right. So in this particular example, Conda Forge would have higher priority. Um, then Bioconda. Bioconda is another channel that has, that extends Conda Forge um, to uh, include a lot more packages that are specific for bioinformatics uh, and genomics. So a great one to be aware of if you do bioinformatics or genomics. Okay, so um, here, here is a, uh, a kind of a, a cheat sheet for how you should think through the problem of 
you know, the package that you want to install isn't available on the default channel. What should you do? So the first thing you should do is you should try uh, Conda Forge. So you would do this by trying to install your package, but just passing the dash dash channel Conda Forge option. Um, you could also check Bioconda, since I, I work with a lot of bioinformatics and genomics users. Um, they often will have packages that are not on defaults, not on Conda Forge, but will be on Bioconda. And then finally, PIP. So we've not talked about PIP before, um, but PIP is the Python um, built-in uh, Python package manager. And you do need to know how to use PIP with Conda. And so there's a question about that at the very beginning of the day. And so I'm going to show you how to do that now. So we're going to do a Conda deactivate. And I'm just going to clear this out. Um, OK, so, so I don't know if you, if you all are familiar with Kaggle. Uh, but Kaggle is a uh, machine learning and deep learning competition platform. Um, and it's a, a great way to become more familiar with cutting edge machine learning and deep learning techniques and get some practice on using these techniques and tools to solve real problems. Um, it has a um, it has a uh, an API that you can use to interact with your uh, from your local machine interact with Kaggle directly. Um, and it's available as a package. But if you were to just do conda search uh, Kaggle, then um, this you'd find that this package isn't available on the defaults channel. It is, however, available on Conda Forge. And so if you just search the defaults channel, you'll get this kind of output. So it won't be, it won't be available for Conda Forge or on default. But if you search with the Conda Forge channel, then you will get that Kaggle is available. And so here um, you can see that the channel for Kaggle is all Conda Forge. So these are all the different versions of the Kaggle package. Okay. Um, then of course, once you know that it's available, you could install it. Um, from Conda Forge. Yeah. Okay, so I've kind of talked through some of what happens when, I, when you install a package, but this is kind of like a flow, uh, a flow diagram. Um, so the first thing that happens is Conda will go off and search for repo data uh, for each channel that you have specified, or just the defaults channel um, if you don't specify anything. And then it tries to find the package or packages that you want to install in the repo uh, data for that channel. And if it can't find it, then it says, well, I can't find a channel that includes this package. If it does find it, then it goes and finds the dependencies of that requested package. And then it says, OK, well, are there any, do the dependencies of this package have any dependencies? Yes or no? If the answer is no, then it downloads and installs the package. If the answer is yes, it kind of repeats this search for dependencies until it basically um, finishes finding all the dependencies and downloads and installs them. OK. Um, so there is an exercise here for installing uh, with the PyTorch channel. Um, so you can get some practice um, installing uh, from the PyTorch channel with this exercise. Um, and there's an example of an alternative syntax. Instead of the dash dash channel option, you can use um, the channel and then double colons followed by uh, the package name, for example. So there's two exercises here uh, for you to take a look at. Um, I think I'm just going to skip over them for now in the interest of time. Um, OK, so because I, I do want to give an example of this. So let's clear this off. OK, um, so a Python package isn't available on any kind of channel. What should you do? OK. 
Um, so the short answer is we're going to use PIP to do this. Uh, there's, but there's a few complexities when getting PIP and uh, Conda to interact um, uh, interact correctly. And the first is that your operating system will often have a version of Python, as will um, it, and will also have a version of PIP. And the operating system Python and PIP are designed to be used not by you, but by the operating system. So you don't want to inadvertently um, use the operating system's version of PIP to install a package because it's going to install that package not in your Conda environment because it doesn't know anything about Conda. It's going to install it somewhere else on your system. Um, so also, if you go to, for example, um, right, so if I deactivate and then um, let's see if I deactivate again, and now I do conda env list. Okay, so my base conda or my base uh, environment is the active environment. Okay. Um, and so if I say which Python, um, so I'm getting the, uh, the Python that is actually from the notebook uh, Python, which is a bit strange. Um, and if I say which pip, I'm also getting the pip that's installed in that notebook uh, environment as well. Um, I was expecting both of these to be the base environment. So this seems to be something that's not quite right on, the, uh, on this cloud instance. Um, but what you want to do is you want to make sure that you install pip into every Conda environment so that when you install the pip that you use to install in your Conda environment is the pip that is in your Conda environment. So for example, if we were to do Conda activate uh, machine learning environment. And now we do uh, which Python and which pip. Oops. Okay, so you see how this pip is inside of this machine learning content environment. So that's the pip that we want to make sure that we use when we install things. And um, the way that we would do this would be to use uh, the following syntax. So we would do Python module uh, dash m pip install and then say Kaggle. Um, so this is going to install Kaggle um, plus any dependencies that Kaggle it needs into our Conda environment. And now if we were to do Conda list, you'll see that we have some packages here that now say PyPI. These are all the packages that have been installed from, excuse me, from uh, as dependencies of Kaggle. And Kaggle is back here. Okay, um, so let's clear that out. Um, so there's another library. So there's an exercise here um, on installing uh, a package into a common environment using pip. It uses a package called combo. Uh, let's just check to make sure that combo is still around. Um, so it's an ensemble learning package. Uh, it's used a lot in Kaggle competitions. It basically takes a whole bunch of machine learning models and comes up with ways of, of uh, combining the predictions of individual models to produce a meta model that has overall better predictions, basically. So um, it's a method of ensemble learning, and you can install it uh, via PIP, for example. Um, so 
why don't you take, um, I'll give you maybe uh, three to five minutes and have a look at these different exercises. So try, try going through and installing a package using pip into your conda environment. And then, you know, take a look at installing packages from specific channels. See how you get on with that. Um, and then um, I'll answer any questions that anybody might, uh, might have. Hello, David. Can I ask yes. a question? Yes. Hi. So I, I see that when we list the, the, the packages that are installed in, in our environment, we get a, a very long list, but most of them seem to be like dependencies of the stuff that we explicitly Correct. install. Yes. Is there a way to just list what we explicitly ask to be installed? Um, yes, I believe there is. Just a moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, shit, what is the... Just a little, let me do a Google search. I've forgotten this command. Um, hmm. I can't seem to find the command. So I'm just consulting Google right now.
right, so let me try. Okay. Okay. Um, so the the short answer is that um, yes, there kind of is, uh, and we're going to see an example of it um, in the next episode. That's why I thought I for, had forgotten the command, and then I remember we cover it later. Um, so I'll I'll mention it as we uh, as we go by. Okay. okay. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, cool. Uh, let me share my screen. I'll just uh, clear this and we will move on. Uh, right, so sharing environments. So this episode is about how to create so we, we've been doing a lot of manual content environment creation and manual installation of packages and things like that. Um, and it's great, it works, um, raised a good question, which is, you know, how do I keep track of the, uh, the, the packages that I have, that I'm interested in, which generally don't include all the dependencies and the dependencies of dependencies and so on and so forth. Um, and so in this episode, we're gonna cover some techniques to do exactly that, whilst at the same time, um, showing you how you can create these things called environment files, which will allow you to share your software stack with others, whether it's research peers or um, collaborators um, or uh, a journal, if your journal requires you to share your uh, configurations of your software stack, um, or if you want to port your, your software stack from your laptop to say IBEX or to some cloud computing uh, infrastructure somewhere, you can use Conda for that too. Okay, uh, so the first thing we need to do is talk about environment files and understand how to create environment files. So an environment file is just a, a text file that has a particular format. Uh, it uses a format called YAML. Uh, YAML is short for YAML ain't markup language, um, but it's basically just a flat text file that has that's structured to be very human readable. Uh, YAML has become the kind of default language or kind of text markup language for um, writing configuration files, basically. Um, so what I tend to do is use environment files always for every project. I always create an environment file. Um, and it's always called environment.yaml. And it always sits in my project directory. So for this um, this GitHub repository that has all of the the code and everything for this entire course has its own environment.yaml file. And this environment.yaml file, which has all these different dependencies pulled from the Conda Forge channel primarily, some from the defaults channel. Um, lots of dependencies, mostly related to Python and things that we'll cover uh, next week, um, or that will be talked about in, uh, in the spring in the more advanced um, scikit-learn and PyTorch uh, courses. Um, but this environment.yaml file is actually what is used um, to create the notebook environment. So um, let me just deactivate this environment. Just clear this out. So it, when earlier when we did uh, Conda environment list, so there's this notebook environment, and I kind of mentioned that Binder created this notebook environment for us based off of you know configuration files in the GitHub repository. Well, it was this configuration file, this environment file that Binder used to create the software stack in the notebook. So if we do uh, Conda activate notebook and then conda list, we will see all, so here's XGBoost, Zeus SQL, Zeus Python, uh, 
uh, weights and biases, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, all, of the, all of the packages listed here, plus all their dependencies and things like that. Okay. So that's where that notebook environment came from. It came from this environment file. And instead of you know, at the command line typing the conda create command to build a machine learning environment, we could have created a little YAML file like this. And um, in that YAML file, we, or we could have structured it like this, basically. So we have the name, and then we list some dependencies. You can put version numbers, if you want, in the YAML files. Um, and you know, we'll talk about Git and GitHub uh, later in this workshop series, but you should always version control your, your YAML files. That keeps a record of of uh, changes to your software stack over time. OK, so how would you use this in practice? So let's uh, uh, clear this out. Um, so how would, I, how would I go about this in practice? So I'm just going to deactivate. OK, so let's make a project directory. So I would make some project directory, OK? And then I would change into that project directory. And now in this project directory, I want to create my environment.yaml file. So I could create it here um, uh, from the, the command line from the terminal. Um, what I'll do is, um, is actually uh, well, actually, I'll just do it from the terminal. I'll say I'll save the text files for next week. Um, so last week we created some text files using a text editor called Nano. So I'll just do Nano uh, environment.yaml, and then in here I'm going to create my environment file. So what if I just come up here, copy that. Um, Oof, I pasted it much too many times. So what I'll do is I will go up here and just, I'm hitting Control and K to delete all of those lines. And then I want to delete that. And then I'll just do uh, Control X. And do I want to save Y for yes? And I hit enter. And now um, I have this environment file, which I just created. Now I went through that pretty quickly. We covered all of that last week. And so you can refer to the, the workshop last the workshop video from last week if you need to, to go over how to how to use that. The, the, the takeaway is whenever you have a project directory, however you want to create it, you create this environment.yaml file inside of your project directory. And then uh, once it's there, and the name can be whatever you want. It could be machine learning environment. You could call it whatever you want. Um, um, and but once you've once you have that environment file, then you do uh, conda environment create. And then I typically do again prefix. Um, and then file environment.yaml. So this is the command that I use for all, it's the same command I use it for all my conda environments because every conda environment I create is created in the same location in a subdirectory env inside the project directory. And they all use an environment file called environment.yaml. So if you hit enter, now at this point, Conda is doing the same exact thing that it does for under uh, for the Conda create command. It goes off, it checks the, the, the repo data at the various channels that um, you've specified. Um, it collects the information about all the packages that you want to install, including dependencies, makes sure it solves for the environment, makes certain that the packages that are going to be installed will be consistent with one another, that they won't um, they won't create uh, errors or uh, or conflicts or anything like this. And once it's done, 
then it will just install all the packages and things. So you're just going to wait until this is finished. Okay, done. Now notice that with this command, there's not as much output that's produced, um, but if we were to activate this environment and then do a conda list, conda list, then you can see that all these packages are installed. So, so there's matplotlib, um, what were the other ones that we installed? Uh, Scikit Learn, etc. So those are those are all there. All right. So then let's uh, deactivate this environment. Okay. Now, how do you generate these environment.yaml files? So there's a um, there's a couple of things that you can do. Um, you can, there's a, an, an export command. So if you do, uh, so let's suppose, let's do a conda activate um, name our basic SciPy environment that we created earlier. Oh, there we go. So we activated our basic SciPy environment and we created this manually from the command line. So we didn't have an environment file. So we can do conda um, emv export. And since we've already activated the environment, I think that's all we need. And so now this gives us um, a extremely detailed uh, environment file. And this extremely detailed environment file has the name, it has channels, and then it has the dependencies, but it lists every dependency, including um, the, let's just find, so here's SciPy. So it has SciPy and then the version number and then the build number. So a lot of very detailed information, uh, much more complicated than, um, than just this simple environment file that we created here. So one of the, and <clears throat> one of the things about this, um, this environment export command that you need to be aware of is that um, this environment export command is operating system specific. So the environment file that I defined here where I just provided a few packages and some version numbers maybe, this will work on Mac, Linux, or Microsoft, or, um, or Windows, for sure. Uh, this environment file, which I created with this export command is Linux specific because it pins the packages and the versions and the build numbers to Linux specific packages. So this is great if you have a Linux workstation and you want to port your conda environment to IBEX, then you could just export this environment file, copy it over to IBEX, which is also Linux based and rebuild the environment would be fine. If you gave this to um, a collaborator that was running Mac or Windows, they wouldn't be able to create their environment from this, um, from this environment file because it would fail because some of these packages and build numbers wouldn't exist for Windows or Mac. So that's something that you need to be aware of. A work, a potential workaround to that, so let's uh, clear, is that you can use the export command um, with this from history option. 
So the from history option gives you the environment file includes only those dependencies that you specifically listed to be installed. So this is the answer to you, Diego, to your question earlier, it is the way that I would get access to that information is I would use, I would use this command. Okay. And now this, you could give to somebody who wants to you who's on Mac, Windows, or Linux, and it would be fine. Because it would allow Conda the freedom to choose versions of these packages that are um, the most recently available versions that are available for that particular operating system. Now, if you don't want to copy and paste this output to a file, you can actually just put a, another option, uh, a file option, and the name and uh, the name of the, the file that you want to write. And now um, you see here, I've, I've created this file, exported environment file. And if I take a look at it, so there's the, there's the file. Now it's kind of weird to, to have this, because this is for a different environment than what's in this project directory. So I probably shouldn't have put it there. Um, um, but oops, um, but it just, just to, it's just to explain like the, how to redirect basically the output to the file. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll let you guys circle back to these exercises. I'll just go ahead and finish the, the discussion in this section and I'll give you some time to, to practice. Um, so in your environment file, um, you can specify channels. So there's a channel section and you list out the channels. Um, we've seen some examples of this already. So these exported environment files are exporting the Conda Forge and the defaults channel. Um, other channels like PyTorch, BioConda, things like that. Priority decreases from top to bottom. So the channels that are listed first will have will be searched first by Conda for packages before channels that are lower down the list. So typically, you always want to have Conda Forge above defaults and then higher priority like PyTorch or Bioconda would be listed ahead uh, before these other channels. Um, packages installed with PIP. So um, if we had, okay, so how, oh, da, 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 da. all right, so let's do this. Um, let's give an example. So the question was, what about packages installed with PIP? So, Let's see, if I do which pip, okay, so the pip is going to be the pip inside my basic SciPy environment. So now if I do uh, Python pip install, um, what would be something that we could install with pip? Um, let's do uh, Dask. So Dask is available from Conda. You should definitely generally install it from the Conda Forge channel. Um, but I'll just try installing Dask here. Okay, so now Dask has been installed. And now let's see what happens if we do, um, Okay, so this is a good point. So it does not, um, so the export from history does not seem to capture the pip install dependencies. However, notice that if you do just the export, then you can get all the pip installed packages listed as part of the exported environment file. And the reason for that is that when you pass the from history option, Conda, Conda basically keeps a record within each environment of all the Conda commands that have been written in the history of that environment. 
And so that's how it's able to figure out from the history of commands, which packages you have manually installed. But when we run a command um, like this, Python dash M pip install dask, Conda has no concept of that package because it doesn't, it's not a Conda command. It's just a, a generic Python command. And it doesn't, Conda is not going to keep track of every generic Python command you've ever written while using the environment. That would be too much. Um, but once you've used pip to install packages, then that information is um, included in the conda uh, list. And from this information, conda can reconstruct an exported environment file that includes everything that has been installed, because every, all of those things are listed here. It seems like in practice, they should be able to do something that would give you, um, oh, sorry, uh, that would give you a pip section in this version that included pip installed things. Um, I think in practice it's doable, but clearly it's not been implemented. So if you want to get a, the short answer is if you want to get um, if you want to get all the pip installed things too, then you need to use the conda environment export and get everything. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so you can update an environment. Um, so there's an uh, environment update command where you can go in and make changes to your environment file and then re, re uh, create the conda environment um, based on the changes of that file. Um, I don't use that command very often because I just typically use this command. So conda environment create prefix file. And then I practice, I, I pass this force option. And the force option just blows away the existing conda environment and then rebuilds it from scratch. So if I need to add or remove dependencies, you know, I would go in here, um, let me deactivate here. And then if I needed to, um, you know, add or remove a dependency. So let's look at this environment file. So suppose I wanted to install um, a Dask. Um, so I would just go in here and I would add, you can put it anywhere you want. I would add Dask, save, and then I would run the uh, conda environment create command. You can do just dash P if you want, instead of dash dash prefix, dash F instead of dash dash file. Um, and if I just run this command, I'll get an error because it'll say, well, this conda environment already exists. So what you need to do is just do a dash dash force, and this will remove that conda environment and then rebuild it from scratch. And I find this takes a, this is a little bit more overhead than using the conda update command, but um, it, it gives you the cleanest, um, the cleanest environment possible because you're just kind of starting from scratch again and reinstalling packages. It doesn't take that much longer generally. Um, and particularly, you, you might be doing these conda environment commands like relatively frequently when you're just getting started with a new project, but pretty quickly you settle into some a list of packages that you're going to use. And then you might not ever rebuild that environment again. Um, so here, this is just going to rebuild the environment, but it's going to add Dask. So while that's going, um, if you want to add pip to your environment file, so this is how you would do it. So you have, um, you always install pip, and then you have a pip subsection. You have a pip subsection. So you have pip, and then a colon, and then an indented block where you list the things that you want to install with pip. 
that kind of thing. Um, you can install directly from, so if, you've used, if you're used to using PIP, um, then you can, instead of listing, um, instead of manually listing out individual packages here, you can have a separate file called requirements.txt or whatever you want to call it, but the default with PIP is a requirements.txt file. And you can just list your PIP installable libraries in that file. And then, um, and there's a typo here. So this, in the newest version of PIP, this needs to be deleted. Um, but basically your PIP block can be the same and you just change the requirements.txt file and then you leave this PIP block alone. So for example, if you go here and you look at this environment file, so this is the environment file again for the, the notebook environment for the whole course. As you see here, there's this pip block and it refers to this requirements.txt file. So in all my environment files, I always have pip followed by a pip block followed by this requirements.txt syntax. And then in this requirements.txt file, I just list the stuff that I need to install via pip. And so I have these two config files, the environment and requirements that are in all my projects. And if I am doing conda dependencies, I add them here. And if I absolutely need to install something with pip, I add it here. And then it's the same, um, it's this same conda command over and over again to create an environment. Um, Okay, so here's that environment that's been created. So j just to show you, so let's suppose that I um, requirements dot text and I add Dask in here. I save it. And then I go back to my environment file and I delete Dask. And then I add this pit block. Um, and then I, instead of list that, so I could just list Dask here, but I find it easier to just do this. And then I never have to change this pit block. If I need to add anything, I just add them to requirements.txt. Whoops. And now if I was to run the same command again, It will blow away that environment, remove it completely. It will install. Um, it will install all the conda dependencies, and then it will activate the conda environment, and then it will run Python -n pip install from the requirements.txt. So this does this nice separation of of um, concerns where you have a separate file for your conda stuff and a separate file for your pip stuff. And then there's just a reference in the environment file to point to the, the requirements.txt file. Okay. Any questions about that? Please do ask questions about the, if you have any about the PIP and Conda, because this is a, it, it's a very common thing that you will need to do. And uh, it often trips up a lot of users. So common mistakes, um, users have a separately installed PIP on their computer or in their profile that's outside of their Conda environment. And then they forget to activate their Conda environment and they just run a PIP install. And it installs it somewhere on their computer. It could be in their home directory. It could be in the root directory somewhere. But it's then they activate their con environment and wonder, like, what happened to my pip install software? So here you can see. So here's the, this is what that looks like when you, you've run all the conda stuff. And then it's installing pip dependencies. And here it's done a pip install of Dask.
So the requirements. So where would you store the requirements.txt file in your project directory? So this keeps everything in your pro. So if you had a project directory, then and or maybe you have some subdirectories for your projects in your project directory, but then you'd have an environment file and requirements.txt file in the same directory. That was a good question. I didn't cover that. Okay. Um, so uh, the last part of this episode, um, just yesterday, <laughs> This tells you something about how fast uh, developments take place in, in, this, uh, in this industry. So just yesterday, I, I became aware of a new tool that actually greatly simplifies um, greatly simplifies the process of linking JupyterLab and your Conda environments. So I'm not going to cover this section now um, because there's a better way to do it. I just didn't have time after I learned about it to write it up for today. But I'll be making a video on um, uh, on our YouTube channel specifically about this new tool. It's called Gator, um, and um, and how I'll show you how it works, and and then you won't have to. It, basically, this process is very manual, and Gator automates it, so you don't have to worry about the details. Um, so uh, I will write. I'll make a separate video about that and. Um, make sure that I share the link with you when it's available, rather than go over something which is too dated to be uh, to be used. Okay, so it's about four o'clock. We're doing pretty good on time. So let's talk about GPU dependencies. So before I talk about that, though, I am I'm generally curious. So um, I'm going to try to create a poll. Um, and then I'm going to I'm going to try to create a poll about GPUs, and I'm going to share it with you. So I'm just curious. Let's try this. OK, so I just created a poll. This is the first time I've done a poll in a Zoom meeting before. So let's see how it goes. So hopefully, this basically has three questions. I want to know, basically, have you ever used GPUs before? Because so I'm trying to gauge kind of how many people are going to benefit directly from this episode. Um, and kind of like where you are. And then there's actually quite a fair number of resources for which you can, or fair, there are a fair number of places where you can get free access to GPUs. Um, and so if you've never used them before and you don't have access to them, then you know I'll try to spread the word about where you can get access to free GPUs. So we'll just kind of see where we are. Okay, so there's a couple of, of uh, questions in here. So do we need CUDA compatible GPUs? So for the most part right now, the answer is yes. So most of the pre-compiled binaries that 
uh, or the packages that you're going to get via for Conda are mostly targeting NVIDIA GPUs. This will surely change, and I would guess it will change within the next year, just based on the, the, the changes that I know that are coming on the hardware side and on the software side. You will start to see more projects um, making packages available for um, other, G other GPUs besides NVIDIA. But right now, it's mostly uh, CUDA-compatible GPUs. Okay. Uh, all right, things seem to have mostly settled down here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and end the poll. Okay. All right, so I'm sharing the results with everyone. So can you guys see the results? So what happens when I share the results? Do you see them or what do you see? You see them, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so it seems like most of you have not used GPUs before. That's totally fine. Um, in fact, that's great because I'll get to explain to you how you can use Conda to manage your GPU dependencies so you won't get confused about how to manage your GPU dependencies or start doing it in a more complicated or wrong way. Um, and most of you do not have access to GPUs. So I'm going to guess then that means that most of you are from outside of Calst because if you're here from, so if just, you know, FYI, for any of you who are new Calst students, as long as you have Calst login credentials, you can access um, IBEX. And as long as you have access to IBEX, you will have access to GPUs. Um, you might be limited in the number of GPUs that you can access. And depending on um, the amount of training that you've taken and your level of, um, well, basically the level of training that you have taken will unlock um, more resources, more GPU resources in particular to you, um, but you'll have access to a GPU um, for sure. And then the last question was, uh, do you know where to get free access to GPUs? Okay. So there are a couple places where you can actually get free access to GPUs. Um, and it's a great, uh, these are great places to go and experiment with um, to learn how to do GPU computing. So the first is Kaggle. So I mentioned Kaggle uh, earlier. So I'm gonna stop sharing the poll results, uh, share my screen again. Um, so you can get free GPUs from Kaggle. So you have to, you've got to create an account on Kaggle and you'll have to read a little bit of the documentation, but you can get access to GPU computing. Um, basically it, it's really very similar to what we have here. It's going to be a cloud-based notebook. Um, it'll be attached to a GPU. Um, you can, you know, do some do GPU computing with PyTorch or TensorFlow or um, Rapids or any of these other GPU accelerated data science machine learning packages. Um, the other is um, Google Colab. So Google Colab is um, uh, cancel. So Google Colab is um, Google's proprietary notebook interface that builds on top of Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab, um, but also provides uh, access to GPUs. And we'll probably, so those of you who are from outside of CalST, if you come and take the advanced training course in the spring, when we cover PyTorch, I will be using um, uh, GPUs probably on IBEX for CalST folks, but then there will be Google Colab versions of the, the notebooks that we'll use available for you, those of you outside of CalST who need to use GPUs to run on Google Colab. So you will get some exposure to uh, Google Colab then. And um, I will put links in the chat. So there's the link to Kaggle. And to use Colab, you need, um, you need a Google account. Um, so 
that's the price you pay for, for getting the access to the free GPUs is that you're going to have to get an account and give over some data to Google or Kaggle. Um, Kaggle actually runs on Google because Kaggle is owned by Google. So at the end of the day, you're running on Google Cloud Computing Resources. Um, and there are a few other places too um, where you can get free GPUs, uh, but those are the two probably that I would start looking at. And in those instances, you don't generally need to install anything at all because all of the NVIDIA libraries will already be pre-installed and not to worry about. It. But let's suppose that you did need to worry about it. Uh, so let's talk about that. Um, okay, so managing your GPU dependencies. So we're gonna see um, which NVIDIA libraries are available via Conda. Um, talk about what you need to do if you need the NVIDIA CUDA compiler, that's NVCC for your project, and then talk about managing GPU dependencies. So first is, you know, what, what CUDA libraries are important and relevant for, uh, for data science or machine learning or, or GPU computing in general? Um, so the first is the NVIDIA CUDA toolkit. So I've got links here to all of the relevant NVIDIA libraries. So there's the, the CUDA toolkit which is probably like the most, um, the, the core uh, GPU code. Um, then there is the NVIDIA Collective Communications Library called Nickel. Um, Nickel is used to communicate efficiently between multiple GPUs, either on the same compute node or server or across GPUs that are distributed across some, some server. So, so that's one, it's a more advanced one that you need, but it's very important if you're doing multiple GPUs um, as part of your, um, your workflow. And then finally, there's QDNN, which is the deep neural network library that NVIDIA has released um, that optimizes computations for, um, um, for doing deep neural networks. Very important if you're doing um, anything with, with deep learning. So there's a question. So can my browser Jupyter environment utilize my local GPU device? Absolutely, absolutely. So if you have if you have a GPU on your workstation, for example, and you use Conda to install and manage a software stack that has GPU accelerated libraries, Conda will install, as we'll see in a minute, Conda would install all of the um, CUDA libraries that you would need. Um, inside your Conda environment. And then those CUDA libraries would detect the GPU on your device and use it. Okay. So let's, let's use our handy, um, uh, Conda search command to see what is available for the CUDA toolkit. So Abdurrahman, what is the SLI enabled GPUs? I don't know what is meant by SLI enabled. All right, so while Abdul Rahman is pondering that, um, there's a question from the chat. So here's the output of the, the search CUDA toolkit. So you can see these are the CUDA toolkit versions that are available. So 9.0 all the way through CUDA 11.3. So um, NVIDIA uh, has an agreement with uh, Anaconda for distributing the CUDA toolkit or all, most all of the, um, of the NVIDIA CUDA libraries. So that's why, and, and NVIDIA distributes quite a lot of their software via either the main Conda channel, the default Conda channel, or they also have their own Conda channel. We'll look at that in a minute. So actually we'll look at it now. 
So if we search and then we add uh, channel NVIDIA, we can see that, um, okay. So here, if you compare here, so here's, so NVIDIA actually distributes a few more versions than are what, what so there's actually an 11.4 version, which is really bleeding edge that's available from NVIDIA. Um, but the most recent available from the main channel is 11.3. And maybe NVIDIA has some older versions that might not be. Um, so no, so everything else looks pretty much the same between Conda Forge and NVIDIA and main, except for 11.4, which is available only from NVIDIA. Okay. Um, well, let me see. So Abdul Rahman has sent me this link to scalable uh, link interface. Okay, so without digging too much into this, what is relevant for, for us is that for the more recent GPUs, which is what you'll end up using, um, they have what's called NVLink technology. Um, and the NVLink is the communication technology that will be um, using Nickel to communicate uh, between GPUs. And you'll find that in cloud instances. And we also have NVLink technology on IBEX um, as well. So the short, I guess the short answer is um, any of the GPUs that uh, you're likely to encounter in the cloud or um, on IBEX will have uh, technology that if you have Nickel installed, Nickel will manage the communication between the, the GPUs optimally. And you won't have to worry about it. Okay. Um, so we did that. Uh, so one of the things to note is that the CUDA toolkit packages don't include the compiler. So this is only relevant if you actually need to compile code, which we haven't talked about um, yet at all. Um, we basically, I, I haven't. I guess I haven't mentioned it, but all the all the software that we've been downloading is all pre-compiled software. So we don't actually have to compile anything, but occasionally you may find yourself needing to compile code in a Conda environment, particularly if you're using GPUs. Sometimes there are packages that have custom GPU code that needs to be compiled before it can be used. And in which case you need the MVCC compiler. But the CUDA toolkit packages from Conda do not include the NVIDIA CUDA compiler. And so we'll talk about what to do if you need the compiler in a minute. So what about, uh, what about CUDNN? So let's do a search for CUDNN. Okay, so here's all the different versions of QDNN that are available on either Condo Forge or NVIDIA. And um, so everything from 7.0 up to 8.2. Um, it's interesting that Condo Forge has more recent versions of QDNN than the NVIDIA channel. Interesting. Um, so QDNN. Um, is like I said, so it's a it's a library for accelerating deep learning computations. Um, PyTorch, which is the most common deep learning library used um, used here at Calst, bundles QDNN together with it, so you don't actually have to install QDNN separately. If you want to use TensorFlow, you do need to install QDNN. So, but you can install it with Conda, just like we have been doing with other other packages. Um, same with Nickel. So 
we want to look for nickel, uh, nickel channel NVIDIA as well. So here are all the different versions of nickel. Um, and nickel, actually, if you're using PyTorch, PyTorch comes with nickel, so there's nothing to install. Um, you don't even, even need to list it as a dependency. With TensorFlow, you do. Um, all right, so let's see some examples. So, um, so this would be an example environment file. I'm not going to install these environment files now because some of them actually take quite a bit of time to install. And so I'm just going to kind of walk you through them. I, I think, I mean, you, you, you're you more than welcome to um, create the environment files and install them yourself now or or after the workshop is done. I'm just not going to do it, uh, do it live. Um, so here's an example for PyTorch. So we've got the PyTorch channel as the highest priority, followed by ContaForge. Um, and def the defaults channel. And then we list our dependencies. So CUDA toolkit, PIP, Python Torch, Torch Vision, or PyTorch. Um, these version numbers are uh, a bit dated. Um, and uh, I think the most recent version of PyTorch is 1.9 or 1.10 now. Um, and Torch Vision is a computer vision package. So this is like an example environment file, like roughly what it would look like. And the, the key is that for each version of PyTorch, there is a, a corresponding version of CUDA toolkit that would be required. So for example, if I was to do, let me clear this out. If I was to do conda search uh, channel PyTorch for PyTorch package, So the most recent version of PyTorch is 1.9, and it's built for Python 3.3. And you can see that uh, PyTorch is distributing um, three different builds for each version of PyTorch. The first one is going to be a CPU-only build. And the, the last two will be, um, will be built for different versions of CUDA and different versions of CUDNN. So you can see this version of PyTorch is built for CUDA 10.2, so that's CUDA Toolkit, and CUDA, CUDA 7.6.5. So for example, if you wanted PyTorch 1.9, then you would need CUDA Toolkit either 10.2 or 11.1. .1. And that would come with CUDA 8.05. And and if you go back um, to older versions, so for example, if we go all the way back to version 1.5, which is probably less than a year old, but still quite a lot of development. So here's 1.5. So these are all the different versions of 1.5. And most of them, you can see there's, there's Python 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, 3.8. And then multiple versions and CP only versions, and then multi three versions, three different versions of CUDA. So you've got CUDA 10.1, CUDA 10.2, and an old version of CUDA 9 or CUDA 9.2 with different versions of CUDA. In it. So lots of different combinations. Um, but basically, all you have to do is um, typically specify your PyTorch version. Um, and then maybe sometimes your CUDA toolkit version, and then let or let Conda choose everything else. Um, and in fact, if you go to the PyTorch website um, and scroll down, so here would be their like install instructions. So if you were on Linux and wanted CUDA 11, then this would be the Conda command to install. PyTorch and CUDA Toolkit 11.1 with a bunch of recommended extra packages for vision and audio and other stuff like that. And you can see, so there's a question about what about non uh, CUDA GPUs? Well, so here is um, the uh, Rockham, which is the um, 
it AMD, AMD GPUs. Um, yeah, AMD GPUs. And they don't yet have Conda packages. So these are coming. Um, you can actually get them, I think, from PIP, but they're not yet available um, from Conda. Um, but they're coming. And they were also coming for TensorFlow and, and, other, um, and other libraries as well. So something to look forward to if you're interested in using non-NVIDIA GPUs. OK, um, there's an example with TensorFlow. Um, but I'm going to skip over, over that. Um, I want to point out, so there's a, a cool library called NVIDIA Rapids. So NVIDIA Rapids is like um, scikit-learn, which, again, we'll talk about in the more advanced course uh, in the spring, except it's accelerated on the GPU. So if, if you have any experience doing just kind of I'll call it classical data analysis or machine learning, and you want to do it on a GPU, then NVIDIA Rapids is the tool for you. And um, all of their stuff is distributed via Conda. Not quite sure why this is taking so long to load. I'll come back to it in a minute. But this would be like a typical um, environment file for, um, for NVIDIA Rapids. Um, and I've got links here to um, some other things. OK, so what to do if you need the NVIDIA CUDA compiler? So if you, need, uh, if you need access to the CUDA compiler, because you need to compile custom code that either you yourself wrote, or more likely, you want to install a library that somebody else wrote that has custom CUDA code that needs to be compiled, uh, before it can be run, then you'll need the you'll need NVCC. So there is a package called CUDA Toolkit Dev, um, which we can search for. Uh, let me clear this out. And the CUDA Toolkit Dev is the development version of the CUDA toolkit, which includes the compiler. And uh, you can see that it has many of the same versions, 11.4, um, 11.3. It looks like there's been quite a lot of work done recently on this, um, on the CUDA toolkit dev package, um, if you need newer versions of CUDA. But it's kind of sparse if you need older versions of, um, of CUDA. Um, so, But if you're happy with a newer version of CUDA, then you can get the CUDA toolkit dev directly from Conda. Um, alternatively, so here's an example of what that might look like. So you just have CUDA toolkit dev. And then typically, if you need the NVIDIA compiler, you're also going to need a C++ compiler. So you can just add that as a dependency. And then off you go. Um, an alternative, um, which we sometimes use on, uh, on IBEX, is if you already have an existing installation of uh, the CUDA toolkit, you can, instead of installing the CUDA packages um, via Conda, you can just install this package, uh, NVCC underscore Linux 64, which will um, make your Conda environment aware of your locally installed CUDA toolkit, basically. But the, and then the trick is that you need to set the version number for this package to be equal to the, um, the version of CUDA toolkit that's installed on your machine outside of your conduct environment. And then I have an example of how you could use this um, with uh, to install Horvod, um, which is a, um, a package for doing distributed deep learning. Um, these are more elaborate. The examples in this section are, are more advanced examples that are more indicative of uh, the type of conda. It, I, what I want you to take away from this is that um, you can use conda to manage very sophisticated scientific and data analysis application stacks that require GPU accelerated uh, dependencies and libraries, as well as compiling code. So and this is very important. It's very important to get across for our CALS users who, um, 
who uh, are going to be using Ibex or, or even Shaheen, you can use Condit to manage your own uh, app stacks on Ibex and on Shaheen. Um, and if you just need some, if you just want to try out some packages or you just want to try out um, some, um, some code that you found on GitHub that's been published by uh, you know, a previous research group or something and you want to replicate it, the best thing to do is probably to, is to take Conda and build a software environment for that, um, test it out and use it. And then if it ever gets to the point where you really need to have um, optimally compiled and installed software that will use the hardware that we have to its greatest capacity or capability, then that's then a good time to approach the, or my colleagues at KSL and get them to work to build your software stack for you to take advantage of the, um, of the hardware that we have to the fullest extent. But most CALS users are going to find themselves in this kind of middle ground where they're best suited by managing their own software app stacks with a tool like Conda. Um, OK. Uh, da, da, da. So that's just a, a detailed Horvat example, um, very detailed Horvat example. Okay, so I think I've reached um, uh, I've reached the end of what I I had planned to talk about uh, today. Um, so if anybody has any questions, uh, now would be the time to ask them. Um, otherwise, we can wrap up a bit early and enjoy uh, the long holiday weekend. Okay, so it seems like no questions. So thank you all very much for, for joining me on this Tuesday afternoon before we, we all break for or a holiday weekend, um, at least those of us in Saudi Arabia. And I look forward to seeing you at the next week's session where we'll get into Python. Um, and that's probably what many of you are, are really here for this uh, um, during this workshop series, just to learn how to program in Python. But I, I do like to kind of go through these more basic tools because they are important. You know, using the Bash shell is a critical uh, skill, as is understanding. It, at least some of the appreciating the complexity of package and environment management and understanding that there are tools available to help you solve that problem. That was the big kind of high level goal for today. Hopefully I accomplished that. Hopefully you at least, um, I'm sure nobody mastered Conda today by any means, but at least you know where to go to learn more. Um, recording of this workshop will be made available um, maybe at some point over the long weekend, otherwise for sure, first thing on Sunday, um, and the link will be sent out to all of you together with the um, environment, <laughs> environment file, no, um, with the with a feedback form. So you can provide some feedback on today's workshop. And uh, otherwise, uh, thank you very much. I'll see you next week. All right, thank you very much. All right, bye everyone.